First of all, thank you very much. You know, there's a lot of realtors in here. At one time, I wanted to live in a gated community. And I got to, my, my dream came true, but don't, don't always follow your dreams because in, uh, <laughs> in 2005, I moved into a gated community. They changed my name to 2189570, gave me 24 hour security, free room, free meals, and I went to prison. I found out that you can go to prison for any reason if you're not careful. We all take risk. And so it got me to thinking when I was talking about today, I wanted to talk about legacy. What is our legacy? How do we want to be remembered? You know, because legacy is about life and living. It's about the past, the present, and what you want to do with your future. How would you like to be remembered? That's a question we all face each and every day. You want to be remembered for the worst thing you did in your life? Or do you want to be remembered for how that you have transformed lives and moved forward in this world? You know, we all have past. Man, I, my past used to be really good. I mean, I grew up in the Leave it to Beaver type family with a mother that was a banker, a father executive in the railroad. I was an athlete. I got everything I wanted growing up. But I grew up during the time where the three martini lunch was how you found business. And what did that cause me to do? It caused me to become a functioning alcoholic. It took me 55 years to come to that conclusion that I was a functioning alcoholic. Because I'd say, oh, I'm, I'm not an alcoholic. I get up and go to work every day. I entertain clients late at night. But it's not true. I found out that I was one. It cost me three marriages. It cost me, <clears throat> in 2003, after entertaining clients, I, I took a life. I hit a parked car on Beltway 8 and the person died a horrible death. I was 53 years of age at the time. First time I'd ever been arrested. And I uh, was charged with intoxication manslaughter. In 2005, I went to prison for six years for intoxication manslaughter. First time I'd ever been locked up in a prison. I tell you, it was scary. I didn't know what to expect. It's 120 degrees in these prisons in the summertime. There's no air conditioning. It's all gang affiliated. And I was, I'll tell you, I was fearful. But you know what? I learned that you have to be brought down to nothing. Huh? Uh, but you have to be brought down to nothing before your iron gets sharpened and you become something. And that's what happened. It took that heat. It took me losing everything that I had to be the person that I'm going to become today. The person I want to be remembered for. I'm telling you, it's not a, it's not a pleasant situation, but you have to live with, with your, the risks that you take in life. I took one risk. I got out when I was 60 years of age. thought my life was over. What was I going to do? I was an executive in the transportation industry for 35 years. I made major decisions. I had million dollar contracts. What was I going to do? And I, you know what? I found out there's, there's more to life than money. There's more to life than what I was living for me. I was living for my wants, not others' needs. So it caused me to make a decision in my life. And what did it was I went to work for prison entrepreneurship. Well, I went through the prison entrepreneurship program. You know, there's 1.5 million people that are incarcerated in the United States. More than any other country around, we have more people incarcerated. 650,000 get out each and every year. What do they do? State of Texas gives you $50, a one-way bus ticket, back to the city you came out of. What are you going to do with $50? Can't buy anything now. And they send you back to the same neighborhood that you were in when you did your crime with the same people that you were involved with. You're not going to ever make a change. 
I was one of those people that walked out that you see with that red bag. You put all your belongings for six years in a red bag and you walk out into the world. You're not equipped to enter life. This is a gentleman that you'll see at a bus stop when he got out of prison at the walls. He got his head in his hands because he don't know what he's going to do. Where's he going to go? There's somebody waiting for you at that bus stop wanting to get your money. They try to sell you anything they can to make you go back into prison. You know, everybody gives up. A lot of them do. You know, when you're driving around, you see all these homeless living under the underpasses and the freeways? We stopped and talked to them. Over 90% were in prison at one time. They had no life when they got out. But they had rather live in that kind of atmosphere than to go back to prison. When you're released, that is the time of the most danger. In prison, you make maybe five to six decisions a day. You make a decision if you're going to get up out of your bunk. If you're going to go to work, a lot of people don't work. They'd rather go sit in front of the TV and play dominoes all day. Or you can go to commissary once a week and buy some food because uh, you don't get very much to eat inside prison. The meals are pretty bad. And the pace of life is really different. You don't have to make a decision because you're told what to do each and every day that you get up. You're told to walk down the hallway but on the other side of a yellow line with your hands behind your back. You're told you're not going to be successful. That you, that you made that mistake and you're going to pay for it. So how do you grow? How do you change your life? You have to have people to come to you and tell you, hey, you have value. So that's the first thing we notice when people get out. You have no social security card because it's been taken away, no driver's license, no birth certificate. So how do you get all of that to restart your life to get a job? Because you have to have that. Health and health care. Uh, there's no health care in prison. If you have a toothache, they pull it. If you're sick, they give you ibuprofen and tell you to go lay back in your bunk. And now I understand, since I've been out, that they even charge you so much a month if you go to the, see their health care doctor there. Alcohol and drug treatment protocols? Not really any. Mine was for, D, you know, for intoxication and manslaughter. I went to a DWI class. You know what we did? Sat there and watched movies. That didn't help me overcome any addiction I might have. Access to transportation. Man, I'd never been on a bus in my life. And at 60 years of age, I had to ride a bus an hour and a half to get to my first job, an hour and a half home. I didn't know how to get off that bus. I had to go and ask the bus driver, please, when I get to a stop, let me know so I don't miss the next bus. So you learn. Family reengagement. Most families have given up on these men that are in prison because they've been to prison multiple times. And they've always heard the same story. Oh, man, I'm going to do better this next time. They manipulate their families. They don't make a change. Job search, you got to check that box, right? They don't have to anymore. they kind of gotten away from that. But you check that box, and the first thing you say, you have a felony. We can't hire you. Housing. You can't find any place. They won't let you rent an apartment if you have a felony. So you're kind of stuck out there. You got $50. You went back to the town you came from. What do you do? That's where we come in, the prison entrepreneurship program. You know, I was lucky enough that they invited me to become involved with that because it changed my life forever. It made me look deep inside my soul and find out what my character was. I didn't know. I thought I was great. I was arrogant. I was egotistical. I thought the world revolved around me. But I sat in a circle, and men told me 
all of my negative qualities. What was my first reaction? <laughs> You're wrong. But as I started looking in the mirror, I realized they were not wrong. I was wrong. Everything they told me about myself was what I was. I was. So what we do is that we go to all the prisons in the state of Texas. We recruit men that are within three years of finishing their sentence. No sexual crime because it's too hard to find housing and jobs. No major case in the last year and no gang affiliation in the last year. We send them a postcard. And that postcard said, we'd like for you to apply to the prison entrepreneurship program. And people look at that, some of them throw it away, and then others will come and say, man, y'all need to go to that program. They fill that out and they send it back. We send them a 16-page application. It's harder to get in in college. You gotta put down everything you've ever done in your life. And we got, we, we got it figured out that one page on down the line is gonna be the same question asked because we wanna see if you can answer that question with integrity, if you've told us the truth. Once we do that, we accept them. We don't turn anybody away. And we put them through a leadership academy. Now the leadership academy is being done remotely. We do it by correspondence. And we look for volunteers like yourself to read what they have to write, and read their homework assignment. You know what their very first homework assignment is? If you died today, what would your obituary say? Man, you're talking about something that'll open your eyes. You look at that and say, this is what is gonna be on my tombstone or my epitaph? This is gonna be my legacy? No. So they write that, but we give them confidence because we tell them, man, you got a chance to change. Just because that's what it says now, you still got a lot of life ahead. When they finish the Leadership Academy, we actually will move them to either Cleveland, Texas, to the Bell Unit, or we'll move them to the Estes Unit in Venus, Texas. They go through a four-month class, and they write a business plan. Man, a lot of them never wrote anything in their life. They didn't even graduate high school. They sat there, and we put them through a college-level course. And we look for volunteers like yourself to be sharks, to come and sit there and to give them feedback so that they can be successful on the outside. When they finish that four-month class, we actually let them graduate. They walk across the stage in a cap and gown. Most of them, it's the first time they've ever walked across stage in a cap and gown. They finished something. They started something, and they finished it. And guess what? Their families are there to watch them. The families that gave up on them say, wait a minute, this person's changed. This person can make a difference in our life. And so now they graduate. They don't, they're not released. They uh, stay there and become servant leaders, become inspired leaders, because they inspire that new class to be the best that they can be. And when they get out, we actually, like I said, this is our behind the fence and, 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 and when they get out, we call it barbed wire business. But there's the character development, three months, entrepreneurship business plan, four months, giving back, being servant leader. They also get a certificate. Have y'all heard of Baylor University? Hank Hammer Business School? They get a certificate from there saying they completed an entrepreneurship program. So now they got out. We tell them, you know that $50? Put it in your pocket. Because we actually send our re-entry team to pick them up. We don't call them re-entry anymore. We call them life caddies. Just like Tiger Woods, he's a pro, right? But he, he won't be successful on that golf course if he don't have a caddy to tell him, hey, there's a hazard up there. You need to go to the left. Don't go straight ahead. So our life caddies are there to help these guys to navigate that. All of our life caddies are graduates of the program. In fact, we have 32 employees, 85% of us graduated the program, but not these two ladies, they haven't been yet, okay. 
So this is, they're bringing our average down, all right? But anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so now we got them out on the outside. We buy them their first meal. We give them a care package. And so we don't want them, if they're from Dallas, to go home to Dallas. We own three transitional homes in Houston and two in Dallas. So we tell them, we're going to give you a safe place. Like this is a safe place, as Elizabeth told us. We're going to give them a safe place where it's all graduates of the program. It's a brotherhood. So they go and they live in our transitional house. Charge them about $110 a week, which is not bad. They have a great place to live, close to bus stop. And then we have a continuing education called eSchool. We're always looking for instructors. Y'all going to teach them different fundamentals about marketing or finances. Employment. Our guys don't have any trouble getting a job. We have 100% employment within 90 days. We have 85% within 21 days, and they're making $12 an hour. You know why? Because we have proven our success on the outside. We've been around 18 years. And out of that 18 years, we've graduated 3,400 men. And you know what? Seven out of 10 men that go to prison, their children go to prison. Out of our 3,500 men, one child is going to prison. We're stopping that cycle. Tell you what, it made me look at things different. I thought everybody in prison should be in prison. They're some of the most intelligent men I've ever run across in my life sitting there, but guess what they didn't have? Didn't have men like you, Jason. Didn't have mentors. Didn't have men like Mac back there. They're both involved in their program. They tell these guys, you got value. Y'all can be successful. And they look at these men that are successful on the outside and also the women, and they go, you know what? Y'all have given me the confidence I need to go forth in my life. We have a business that accelerates. They want to start their own business. We got everything they need. We're going to give them every tool they need to be successful if they want to utilize it. You know, I can get up here and give you numbers all day long, but we keep track of our numbers. If you look at the uh, yellow line, that's the TDCJ recidivism rate. It's up around, they say 25%. The bottom line is our PEP graduates, and it's lately been running consistent less than 7 or 6%. And if they go through our reentry program on the outside, it's less than 5%. It's come live in our house. But the interesting thing I see is that green line. That is men that we accepted into our program, but TDCJ did not move them there. Could have been because they got out early, they got a major case, or something happened. Their recidivism rate is the same or higher than TDCJ. We don't cherry pick. We pick everything. We believe in social justice. 60, I'd say about 67% of the people that go through a program are of color. It's across the board, just like TDCJ, a third, a third, and a third. We want to give everybody the opportunity to be successful. This is our, uh, we believe in economic mobility. Because we teach them about, you got to get your FICA score up. you got to do all this if you want to be successful on the outside. And you can see our starting pay, they, a lot of them don't have a FICA score. It's less than 34, probably less than, uh, I can't even see that. I don't have my glasses on. 560. But anyway, it's low because they've never had credit. So we get that FICA score up. They start out making about $11.50, $12 an hour. And they work hard. And they all of a sudden, their employers look at them and they move them up into management positions. And you can see after three years, they're making about $25 or more an hour. When they first get out, most of them live in, a they live in a transitional home or live at home with the family. Look after three years. 42% will be calling you realtors and say, hey, I want to buy a house. And you're going to say, wait a minute, no, I'm just kidding. You're going to say, okay. Because they've got their credit built up. They've proven themselves. They've got a good job. They're paying taxes. We're in the process 
of building a volunteer center over at the East End Maker Hub in Houston on navigation. It's the old Baker Hughes. We want it to be a place that's a show place for these guys plus the volunteers. You know what we're calling it? The Collider. Because we want volunteers to collide with these men that are getting out so that they can mesh together and form a DNA that is unbelievable to make them to the next level. We're going to have everything in it. We're going to have a videography studio. I'll even let you come use it sometimes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to, we're going to have a, a stage there where we can do events like I'll do here. We're going to have offices that they can sit in and do one-on-ones with. And we're always looking for volunteers that want to. Now, it's only for men to be a mentor, okay? right now. But we got other things that y'all can do. We got a lot of different ways y'all can help out. But it's about when people, when they're successful, it's touch points. It takes because nobody's ever touched them yet by just saying, hey, you you can do this. Most people in prison have been told you you're a loser. You're coming back. Volunteers are saying, you're not a loser. You're not going back. You're going to take care of everything on the outside. You know, so uh, we have some bankers in here too. And you bankers know that if you've got a felony and you try to go borrow money, nah, it's not going to happen. So how do you start a business? Well, we decided why don't we start our own banking company called it Entree Capital. Where they, we got impact investors they donate money to this. They use DAP funds and others. They donate their money, and we establish the banking system. Now our guys can get low interest loans. Now they have to, pay, they're all paying, we have I think 12 loans right now, and they're all paying them back on time. It's really working out great. You know, we're gonna probably, we're looking for 500,000 or more this year. But anyway, the banking is really working. So, I told you, we're a business company, right? We're, we believe in business, starting your own business. But a lot of our guys want to be entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs. So, but what we tell them, okay, put your business plan together that you brought on the inside, and let's see what we can do. Well, we call it the B2B, barbed wire to business event. We do one in Dallas and one in Houston. We pick, we vet them. We pick some of about three or four of our best business plans. We bring them to the shark tank. We bring all these sharks in. They sit there and they listen to these men and their business ideas. And they vote on it. They vote on it and they say, hey, that was a great idea. And you can see right here, we did one. It's a proof of concept. We did one in 2019 and all of a sudden the COVID came. We did one here last year. We're doing one in September in Dallas. And we're trying to pick the best guys to get up there and perform. In fact, uh, one of the guys that won, the one in Dallas, he was my cellmate for three years. He was a drug dealer out of West Texas. We'd sit there, he was on the top bunk, I was on the lower bunk. We would sit there and we would talk, what are we gonna do when we get out? What do, we, what do we want to do with our life? He had no skills besides selling drugs. Well, he went out to West Texas, and uh, he went to work for a, war, a trucking company that was taking water out to the sites. One day, his truck broke down. He called the main office, and he said, uh, truck's broken, what do I do? They go, well, there's nobody to come out there and help you. Well, he went on his cell phone, went on YouTube, Found out what was wrong with that truck, and he fixed it. Then he said, man, that's a great marketing. That's a great business idea. Why don't I do that? Well, so he started. He went, and they put us in him through a school to learn about mechanics. He started his own business. The first year, he did $1.9 million. He did $331,000 with net. Not bad, right? He found out it was more profitable doing water than, than drug, but anyway. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he won. He got $100,000 from us, from Entree Capital. 
So he wanted to open up a storefront, but he, we put him with a mentor. Mentor said, no, I think you, why don't you get some more trucks? He goes, okay. So he went out and got two more trucks. He was doing over $3 million this year and then everything else. We had another one that uh, had a steel fence company. He said, I need uh, 17000 for a forklift so I can move my product around. He was doing about probably about $200,000 in sales, building these metal fences and putting them up. We gave him a mentor that told him all the pitfalls of, of installing these fences himself. We gave him the 17000 He's going to do over $2 million this year. He's hired five people. It works. If you give somebody the opportunity and you give them the resources, it'll work. You know, we all say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We're all running the race each and every day here in our life. Are we going to finish that race? Are we going to give up? Are we going to look and say, I'm, I'm satisfied with my legacy. I don't want to go anywhere else. I'm proud of what I've done in my life. I'm content. I don't want to move forward. I don't want to help others. Or are we going to make a difference in somebody's life? We all can. You know, it's so funny. I, I go into prison all the time, even after I served all that time there. And I see volunteers like yourself come in. And they come in there and they have the attitude, okay, I'm going to help somebody. You know what they do when they leave? They look at me and say, wow, you have touched my life forever. I'll never forget, uh, U of H's uh, Wolf Center comes into our events all the time. And it was a Saturday, and it was a U of H's homecoming. And they brought in 50 students. And I met this one at the door, and I was talking to him, and he was in a bad mood. I said, why are you in a bad mood? He said, it's homecoming. I said, okay. So he said, they made me come here. I'd rather be at the homecoming of U of H. I said, okay, well, just, you know, you're here now. The bus isn't going to take you back, so you're stuck. He came to me afterward, and he goes, you know what? I can go to homecoming any, any year. What I've learned today has touched me for the rest of my life. And that's true. It's about, I told you, I used, I never knew what prison is about, but to me, if I touch a person inside that changes their life, man, that's so rewarding. I can't, I can't believe how rewarding that is. You know, I, I had the, the name, I told you, 2189. It wasn't a good name. But in PEP, we all have sweet names. We get de-gangsterized people. I'm granny panties, okay? Don't laugh too much. <laughs> I don't know how I got that one, but I'll tell you what. It, every, every, I mean, and, and people call me that all the time. I'll be uh, somebody that knows me. They'll come up to me and they hey, granny panties. I go, okay, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that get, we, we want to de-gangsterize men in our program. Because how do you change if you still got that hardened feature on you? You have to change. And you have to be willing to change. And that's what's taking place. So anyway, that's what, this is what our program's all about. We're looking for volunteers. We want you to make an impact on somebody's life. Any way you want to volunteer, we're here to help you. But you know what? Just think of who you're going to help in, in the future, because that's what it's all about. And I've already done that one. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. See, you guys can be so upset. Thank you. I'm Al Massey, and I'll take any questions.